welcome to The Art of Sir, and welcome back to the Forbidden Arts of ZFS series, episode 2. If you're new to this channel, be sure to check out the first episode in the series. As in the previous episode, I'm going to start this video with a warning and disclaimer. The Forbidden Arts of ZFS is a series of videos where I'm going to show you how to use ZFS in very unconventional ways. The methods and techniques shown in these videos may not be safe for you to use with your own data. There may be undisclosed reasons why you should not do what I show in these videos. What you see in these videos should be considered for entertainment purposes only, and you should not try these things at home. Should you choose to copy or imitate the things I do in these videos, you may be putting your data at risk and you are fully responsible for your own data. I have given you fair warning. Any actions you perform after watching this video is at your own risk, and I shall not be liable for any damages, losses, or any other negative consequences of your own actions. Should you benefit from the knowledge imparted upon you by these videos, you are encouraged to smash the like button, subscribe to this channel, share this video with your friends, and leave a comment. Additionally, you're also encouraged to use the links in the video description to shop at my eBay store for awesome server goodies. Okay, so with that out of the way, today's video involves this. This is a Best Buy Easy Store 12 terabyte external USB drive. And no, I'm not going to show you how to remove the hard drive from the USB case. I've already done that, and if you're interested in that, I'll leave a card in the corner for you to check out that video. What I'm going to do with this external USB drive is to use it as an external USB drive. Something like this, especially with this large capacity, like this 12 terabyte unit, is also a great option for external backups. You already know this video is about ZFS, so you might be thinking, I'm about to create a ZFS disk pool with a bunch of USB drives. Well, you would be wrong. All I have today is this one 12 terabyte USB drive, and that's all I'm going to need. ZFS may be great at building disk pools out of many hard drives, but that's not the only thing ZFS offers. ZFS is so feature rich compared to other file systems and volume managers, it's many of these other features that make people, like myself, love ZFS. So today, I'm going to show you how to apply these other features using this single USB drive. However, before I can do that, I need to open your minds. So let's plug this drive in and get on the computer. If you're new to ZFS and you have been learning about ZFS, you may have come across some conflicting information regarding the use of partitions versus providing the whole disk to ZFS. Many years ago, back in the early days of ZFS on Solaris, if you partitioned a disk and shared it between ZFS and UFS, the legacy file system used by Solaris, the disk cache would be disabled since UFS didn't handle power loss events very well if the data in the disk cache was lost. But if you gave ZFS the entire disk, it would enable the disk cache and performance was much better. For this reason, giving the entire disk to ZFS was always recommended back in those days. Fast forward to today, and a lot has happened since. Open Solaris has shut down, and along with it, ZFS. The last open source release of ZFS was then forked and later became the OpenZFS project. This was then ported to several other operating systems, including FreeBSD, Mac OS, and Linux. Today, there are slight differences between these implementations of OpenZFS. One of these differences is the use of partitions. Under Linux, when you give an entire disk to ZFS, it automatically partitions the drive for you anyway, while this is not done under FreeBSD. My point here is that it is okay to use ZFS with partitions rather than the whole disk, contrary to what you may have been told. It's automatically done for you anyway if you're using ZFS on Linux. If you can accept the concept of using ZFS with partitions, then a whole new world of possibilities will become available to you. And that is exactly what I'm going to do today with this 12 terabyte USB drive. Now, before we get hands on, I want to start by providing some motivation. You see, I'm looking at this 12 terabyte external USB drive as an external backup destination. But data backups are only useful if the integrity of the data remains intact when an unfortunate event happens and we need to restore data from backups. So the question is, how do we know the integrity of the backup data? Now, if we were using some commercial data backup solution, such a system might generate checksums of our data archives so that we can check their integrity. But if we're just copying data to an external USB drive, how do we verify the integrity of the data? 
Well, one way might be to compare the data to the original source. Except, what if the source data has changed since the data was copied? What we really need is to compare the data to the source at the time the copy was made. I guess we're just going to need a time machine. So as you can see, this problem can become complicated and it needs a solution and that's what a good commercial data backup solution can help solve. But in lieu of such a data backup solution, we can use ZFS. Remember, by default, ZFS will check some each data block and we can use this to check the integrity of our data. But wait, there's more. What happens if ZFS detects that we have corrupted data blocks? ZFS can report on such errors, but it won't be able to repair the data without extra copies of that data or parity information. Some commercial data backup solutions generate parity files alongside the backup archives, and we can use those to restore lost data. How do we use ZFS on a single drive and accomplish this? This is where partitions come into play. So let's start by putting a GPT label on this drive and make four three terabyte partitions on it. Okay, so we can see that the Easy Store 25, well, Easy Store 25 FB or the 12 terabyte drive is designated as dev SDJ. So we'll start by creating a GPT label on that. And then we're going to create a partition the first partition that will cover the first quarter of that drive. Next, the next partition will cover the second quarter. And the third partition will cover the third quarter. And the last partition will cover the fourth quarter. So now you can see that we have four three terabyte partitions. And what I'm going to do now is create a ZFS RAID Z1 pool with these four partitions. I'm going to call this pool ext backup one. All right, so now we have formed a RAID Z1 pool out of these four partitions. I know what you may be thinking here. If this drive completely fails, all the data is lost. That's true. And this configuration is not meant to survive a complete drive failure. That's not the point, as this is just an external backup drive. Additionally, this configuration has a performance penalty. Since each stripe is spread across four different regions of the drive, it must seek up to four areas to read or write. So this is not meant to be a high performance configuration either. But again, that's not the point. These may be acceptable compromises because now I can verify my data. And should I ever have an unreadable sector on this drive, the lost data can be reconstructed from parity. So let's go ahead and create a data set and copy some data into it. So I have this very large file, which is the first 1 billion bytes of the English Wikipedia, all contained in one text file. I'm going to copy this file over to that data set. So I just copied over a large text file, which is the first 1 billion bytes of the English Wikipedia. As you can see, the performance is definitely less than what this drive can normally sustain, but it's not horrible either. And we can see how much space is used in ZFS with So the file we just copied over is now occupying 954 megabytes in ZFS. 
And if I want to verify the integrity of this data, it is as simple as this. We'll give it some time to let the scrub complete. However, if there was an unreadable sector, ZFS would have been able to correct the problem. So although we sacrificed performance, we've now gained a way to verify the data and correct it, so long as the problem is just a bad sector. But wait, there's more. The 1 billion byte file that I just copied was mostly text, which is highly compressible. So if we want to save some space in our external backup storage, we can enable compression in ZFS to do this seamlessly for us. So let's start over and recreate our data set with GZIP compression. Now, GZIP compression is not the fastest, but speed is not our goal here. And GZIP usually gives better compression ratios. And we can verify we now have compression turned on. All right, let's copy that file again. Now, you may have noticed that performance was much better this time. And that's because we're compressing the data before writing it to the drive which is reducing the amount of actual data that needs to be written to disk. Now, let's see how much space we actually used and what our compression ratio is. You can see we're using only 332 megabytes and we have a compression ratio of 2.87 times. So not only can we verify and correct our data, we can save space too. These are all features that can be very useful on an external backup drive. But wait, there's more. So let's say that we might be storing the external backup drive at some remote location for safety purposes. Or perhaps we want to make sure that if this drive ever got stolen somehow, that our data remains private. If such privacy or encryption at rest is needed, ZFS can do that too. So let's create a private one data set where we store all our sensitive data. Okay, so what I'm doing here is enabling encryption for this data set. And I'm specifying that the key location is equal to prompt, which means that the program will prompt me to enter the key, the encryption key. The key format is also a passphrase. There are other options for you to locate the key in a file, uh, as well as format the key as uh, a hexadecimal value or a raw value. I also included the GZ compression in this data set as we had before, since that seemed like a great feature to have. So let's copy over the 1 billion byte uh, from Wikipedia again. All right, so let's go ahead and export this pool now. and I'm going to re-import it. So as you can see, after re-importing this pool, the, the root pool, which is the ext backup one, is automatically mounted. 
the other the original pool that we create or the original data set that we created under slash data one uh, or that sorry slash data set one is also automatically mounted however slash ext backup slash private one which is our encrypted data set is not automatically mounted and that's because we have not given it the encryption key and so it's not accessible at this time we can provide the key to zfs in the following way And then we can mount the encrypted uh, data set once again. So now the encrypted data set is available again. And we can see that our 1 billion byte file is still there. So far, we've got data integrity checking and healing. We've got data compression. And now we also have data privacy. Not bad, right? But wait, there's more. So. I know most people think about data backup as a way to prevent data loss when you lose a hard drive, right? But that's actually not the main reason why backups are useful. Probably the most common reason to need to restore data from backups is when you accidentally delete or corrupt your files. So does ZFS have a solution to this problem? Indeed, yes, it does. So let's say that you are regularly backing up your data to this single 12 terabyte USB drive set up just like we currently have. Every time you copy the latest data over to this drive, normally you would lose access to the previous version of that data since you'd overwrite it with the latest version. ZFS has this neat feature called snapshots, which allows you to preserve all the data at a single point in time. So every time we're about to copy data to this drive, we're going to take a snapshot to preserve the data as it is before we change it. And this can be done like this. This command creates a snapshot with a timestamp so we know when it was created. And we can list the snapshot to verify it was successfully created like this. Now let's say we accidentally copied the text of the King James Bible over the 1 billion byte Wikipedia file. Notice that the file enwic9 is now no longer 1 billion bytes long, but only about 4 megabytes. Now, several days later or weeks later, we discover our error. The error has already been copied to this backup drive, so what we need is the data as it was before that error occurred. And this is where we are saved by snapshots. ZFS snapshots can be easily accessed by a hidden directory like this. And here we can see our snapshot from earlier. And we can easily access the old version of the file. And there you have the file enwic9 with 1 billion bytes. So even on a single drive, ZFS can provide all these wonderful features. I know in my last video, it might have sounded like I was a little bit critical of ZFS, but that's not really the case. I just don't like misinformation being spread and although ZFS is not God's final gift to humankind, I do think it's an incredible piece of technology when it comes to data storage. After watching this video, I hope I've been able to share my love of ZFS with you, and I hope that I've opened your eyes to some interesting and unconventional ways of using it. Well, that's it for today, guys. If you liked this video, be sure to hit the like button, and if you're new to this channel, be sure to subscribe to see more videos like this. And if you'd like to support my channel, check out my eBay store. I've got all sorts of goodies ready for use with ZFS. The links are in the video description below. Thank you very much for watching and have a great day, guys. Bye-bye.